Okay, so I'm going to talk about a, a, a small project that we've been working on for what seems like forever, because we are conservation practitioners and don't ever have time to do anything. Um, so looking at using conservation evidence to make mammal management more effective. Um, and this is a slightly different sort of schematic from the ones that we saw from Neil this morning, but essentially the, the, you know, the main point is that conservation actions should be based on decisions that are informed by the best available evidence. And I've come up with a sort of three quadrant uh, thing here. Is this a pointer? There we go. Okay, so if you, if you think about this, um, on these two spectrums, um, on, on the bottom here we've got where evidence is not available or, or where it is, and going up on the y-axis where evidence is not used or it is used. And clearly this one, this quadrant here doesn't make any sense because you can't use evidence if it's not available. But um, if we think about it, we're actually, we sort of move in a, in a direction from quadrant A where evidence is um, not used because it's not available, so we really just don't know anything and we're not making use of it, to a, a place where evidence is actually available but it's not being used for a number of different reasons. It could be poor accessibility or uptake or the fact that you're conservation practitioners and you don't have access to the evidence in, in the journals. Um, and then ideally we're moving up into quadrant C where uh, we have evidence-based or evidence-informed conservation uh, because it is available and it's accessible and it's being used by everybody. Um, and so what is evidence for interventions? Um, very simply, there are any specific action where the effects of the action on biodiversity or ecosystem services have been monitored quantitatively. Um, I'll turn this flashing torch off. Okay. All right, so I mean, in its simplest form, it's we did X to test Y and we found Z. Very basic, very simple. It sound, makes it, make it sound really easy. But, um, and there is a formal framework uh, to, to look at this. I mean, you've heard about the Centre for um, Environmental Evidence. Um, there's the Cambridge Unit, uh, the, the Conservation Evidence Project. Um, and you know, a lot of very clever people have been looking into this, this, these things for a while. And I, I don't know how many of you are familiar with some of the products that have come out of the Conservation Evidence Project. These synopses, there's a, I know that there's a bird one and a bee one, and they're working on several others. Um, and there is also a conservation evidence journal which specifically looks at publishing um, the results of, of, of work that's tested the effectiveness of interventions. Um, just to touch qu quickly on, on one of the, a small case study on the bird synopsis. Essentially, this uh, captured scientific um, evidence um, from over 3,000 studies. I don't know if that's changed since I had this information, but um, on the effects of interventions to conserve biodiversity. And, um, there were 322 bird conservation inter interventions that were identified from all of these studies. Um, and then uh, all the realistic interventions were listed for different species groups or habitats in question. And then each piece of evidence was described, including the methods, as clearly as possible, allowing readers to assess the quality of the evidence that was provided by those studies. Um, and this was done very cl working closely in partnership with conservation practitioners and policy ma makers and scientists. Um, to try and develop a list of interventions and, and to ensure that most of the literature was covered. And now Jess, who's sitting in the room, <laughs> was involved in looking to see whether this bird synopsis actually has been helpful um, and essentially asking the question, are conservation practitioners focusing on bird management willing to use a synopsis of the relevant scientific literature to inform their management decisions? Um, and essentially, and I hope I've caught, captured it right, Jess, <laughs> feels a bit strange presenting your paper. <laughs> <But> <laughs> Um, uh, the, the key results, uh, that, well the ones that I thought were key, <laughs> were that each survey participant actually changed their likelihood of using almost half of the interventions after reading the synopsis of the evidence. So it, it seems that people thought that this was going to be useful, they, they felt that they would use these things. What was also interesting was that the more experienced practitioners were less likely to change their management practices than those with less experience, which uh, is very, very interesting and, and perhaps not very positive. Um, even though they were not more aware of the existing scientific information um, than the less experienced practitioners. Um, and then the third key thing was that improved accessibility to scientific information would benefit conservation management outcomes. So looking at this, we at EWT thought it would be very useful to try, you know, a lot of these synopses are global um, in their scope, and we thought, you know, to hone down and try and develop a, a sort of mini synopsis for South, South African mammals essentially to support decision-making um, in mammal conservation management in South Africa uh, by identifying and summarizing all the available scientific evidence for the um, effectiveness of actions. And so very simply, our steps were to, to compile a list of threats and interventions, 
search the existing literature and distill this into a handbook of evidence for interventions for, for, for mammal conservation, and then, and then distribute this handbook to managers, managers and then investigate the uptake of evidence. It's basically a sort of mini, mini project, you know, in the scale, not, not at a global scale. And one of the great tools to do this was the, the revision of the Mammal Red List, which we're currently undertaking. We started at the beginning of last year, and um, I put two, 2014 there, but it's not going to be done this year, so uh, you can say 2015. But essentially, I'm, I'm sure you're familiar, the Red List assesses species uh, national status. So this is a national Red List according to um, standardised IUCN Red List criteria. And it really is a massive compendium of information on the status and trends and numbers and distribution of species. It also you know, gathers a lot of information about status and trends and threats, and, and we've added something to our national red list where we're looking at, trying to look at the effectiveness of interventions. And so these two last components are really what would be useful for this, this mammal synopsis. And what we've done is we've, we've only got 81 sort of near to complete assessments at the moment. There are a lot that are hovering at the near to completion uh, line. But out of this sample, what we did is we took a list of threats and interventions that were identified by the red list assessors themselves. So the, the species experts that are working on these species. Um, and there were a number of inconsistencies in, in these um, threats and interventions. So there's sort of inconsistencies in the level of detail. So some assessors, for example, will just say that disease management is an is a, a, you know, intervention. Well, that's very hard to test. Whereas vaccinating feral dogs against rabies to prevent wild dog rabies outbreaks is something much more specific and something that we can actually go out and test. So we've had to sort of refine those lists to try and come up with things that, that made sense from a, from a sort of testing effectiveness point of view. Um, there were also inconsistencies in description. So where somebody might say bushmeat hunting is a threat and someone else says poaching and snaring is a threat, you know, we've had to just sort of make some arbitrary decisions and clump things together, and so we, we, we put, pull those together and call it bushmeat trade. And so out of those 81 mammal species, we identified 41 unique threats and 58 interventions. Now, I must point, that, point out that this is a slightly different process from the normal synopsis process, because the, the, these, the, you know, these higher-level global synopses take the IUCN threat categories and intervention categories, and they work on a very top-down approach. That's something that we're going to do as well. We haven't done it yet. Um, but because we had this really good compendium of raw data to, to work with, we, we, we tried to go from the bottom up, and this is where we've got to so far. So I've just listed the top five threats here for mammals that have been based on the sample of 81 species. And I must mention as well that those species covered all the different orders, so they, you know, they're not, it's not just carnivores in here. But um, at the moment, uh, the top threat seems to be direct persecution, um, not typically of uh, damage-causing animals. But then there's a whole range of others, loss of habitat quality due to crop agriculture. It's interesting, uh, one of the talks this morning also identified that as a, a primary threat. Bushmeat trade, um, loss of habitat due to livestock, and also to climate change. Now, obviously, these are all, the, these uh, three things here are all, um, sorry, um, all related to loss of habitat. And uh, we're going to have to give a bit of thought as to whether we think we should be lumping these together, because if we did, of, co of course, then habitat loss would come out as the, the, the primary threat. Uh, but I think it's going to be important for us to think carefully about what it means in terms of really assessing interventions. So if the interventions are very different for uh, dealing with uh, loss of habitat due to crop agriculture compared to livestock, then we might, it might, there might be a sort of functional purpose of keeping these things separate. And then also just to list the top five interventions um, that people ident uh, identified from these 81 species. Um, and you can see things like dropping fences to form conservancy, so expanding areas and expanding connectivity, protected area expansion, um, reintroduction. There's some stuff about education and awareness on the bottom there. Um, but really a lot of it's to do with trying to secure more land for biodiversity. So... We then wanted to see, is there, is there any evidence for the effectiveness of intervention? So the Red List has provided us with a nice framework for getting an idea about what the threats are and what the interventions are. So we, uh, as a start, we've taken the South African Journal of Wildlife Research, and the reason we chose that, it's a local journal, it's hopefully more accessible than some of the international ones, and, and it also aims to bridge the divide between science and management. Certainly um, that's what it says in, in the scope on the website. So 
We, we trawled all of the e-publication records between 91 and 2014 and found 547 papers, 397 of which were on mammals. And of those 397, only 19 of them actually tested interventions, provided any kind of um, information about the effectiveness of interventions. Um, and what's really important is that only two of those actually provide strong evidence for the effectiveness of interventions. So they were randomized, replicated, or controlled. So they, a lot of the studies are just descriptive before and after studies. And, and so really, I mean, two out of 397 ain't good. <laughs> so, um, so then we thought, you know, maybe there is a journal effect. So perhaps South African Journal of Wildlife Research has got an impact factor of less than one. If you're a really good scientist, if you're doing good science, if you're doing randomized and replicated controlled studies, why would you publish it there if you can get it into a higher impact journal, you know, um, somewhere else, an international journal? So we're going to explore this a bit more, more deeply, but we've, um, we've done a quick sort of uh, investigation, and we took the Journal of Wildlife Management, which is an international analogue to the South African Journal of Wildlife Research, it's got a much higher impact factor. And, uh, and we looked at how many mammal papers, you know, sort of took a subsample of mammal papers, looked at 198 of them, and so tried to see how many of those tested interventions. And, and only nine of those did. And if we plot them against each other, actually, there's absolutely, I didn't have to do any stats on this. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, so what we're seeing is the analogue for the South African Journal of, of Wildlife Research, um, you know, the, based in the States, is pretty much doing about the same as, as we are here. Um, so there's no immediate evidence for a journal effect. This could be different when we start to investigate other journals, but, you know, our sample size is very small. And when we look and see what types of interventions were tested, um, the majority, well, it's hard to say majority when there's only 19, <laughs> but... But four of them looked at interventions that addressed direct pers persecution, which is good, because remember I said direct per persecution was a, a major threat. But none of them actually tested the interventions that the Red List assessors had actually identified. So there is still, even though we're sort of moving in the right direction, there is still a, a, a gap there. And all of the other interventions were kind of randomly spread across a whole bunch of different things. So, I mean, the rest of the papers were um, spread across different interventions. The other thing is that there was no evidence on interventions to address habitat loss. Even though, you know, those t out of those top five uh, threats, three of them related to habitat loss. And, and so it's despite that this is listed as a primary threat in our sample of, of 81 mammals. So the key messages from this, and we've still got lots of work to do, um, and we're just starting to get really excited about it because some interesting things are, are, are coming out. Um, um, I really feel for, for Neil for all of the abstracts that he, he's read. But um, the first thing is that there's a dearth of robust evidence on the effectiveness of mammal conservation intervention. So we, we definitely are very firmly, I keep pressing the wrong thing, and, um, stuck in quadrant A. So the evidence is not available. It's not being used and it's not available. Um, and we really, I think, even if we um, really sort of jig up our systems and, and get better at asking the right questions, um, based on the number of hands, or, you know, who's got access to these journals, we, we're pretty far away from actually being, having good uptake, even if the evidence was available. Studies often provide conservation rec recommendations. So, you know, loads of papers will do some elephant modeling, and at the end they say, you know, we, sh we should increase the size of reserves to do, you know, some sort of throwaway recommendation. But these are very rarely quant quantitatively assessed. So, um, um, and it isn't just because people don't publish stuff in the South African Journal. It's, there's no journal effects so, um, so far. And even when interventions are assessed, there is quite a big misalignment with conservation priorities. So, just to reiterate um, something I've been banging on for a long time, we, we really need proactive and creative science at project inception to maximize knowledge generation given our resource constraints. And I've put that little circle up saying informational triage. We, we can't understand everything. We can't do everything we want to do. But we should at least be trying to tackle the things that are the most important. Um, you know, when we say that there's threats to species, we should be tackling those things. Uh, I know there's small, sam you know, small sample sizes, financial limitations, but we need to be uh, aligning our efforts um, in a way that's most effective. And so practitioners and researchers need to work together to generate relevant hypotheses with an emphasis on high priority issues. And finally, 
The Red List assessments do provide a really useful framework to guide eff effective conservation evidence research. And so our proposal um, is to um, really try and bring these two frameworks together, the conservation evidence framework and the Red List uh, uh, framework, and to really use them to kind of leverage off each other the, the most important information that we really need to know to be effective practitioners. Thank you very much. <laughs>